Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to your Valentine's Views podcast for Thursday. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube, and subscribe across the Big Blue View Radio podcast network, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, uh, thought what we would do today is maybe something that, that I initially intended to do on Wednesday, which is do a review of the 53-man roster. I kind of thought that uh, you guys would enjoy the Justin Pugh interview that uh, that I posted on Wednesday a little bit more maybe than 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 another review of, of the Giants roster decisions. But we'll do that today, especially since the Giants have uh, built their initial practice squad as well as their 53-man roster. And, and here to uh, to help me uh, break down all things about the Giants roster is Big Blue Views' Tony Del Genio. Tony, welcome uh, welcome aboard. How are you? How are things? I'm doing great, Ed. I hope you're doing well, too. I am. And, you know, for the for those uh, for, for folks who, who listened to us try to live stream, you know, a week or so ago, the, the best news is we figured out the echo. We're all good. We sound normal. Not that either one of us sounds great, yeah. but we sound gonna, normal and there's no echo. <laughs> I was going to say normal. I don't usually hear that word in connection with me, but well, you know, neither one of us is, is a hundred percent normal, but you know, but we, well, but we, at least, thing, you probably aren't. Uh, there you go. There you go. All right. So Tony, let's, uh, let's talk about this roster. Uh, some surprises, I got, you know, I, I got, I didn't total exactly how many I got wrong in my 53 man prediction. I got a couple more wrong than I had hoped to get wrong. There's a couple things that, that I should have seen coming and didn't see coming, but I have to start with this. The one thing I did not see coming that nobody saw coming was a trade for Boogie Basham on, uh, uh on Tuesday morning. Just, uh, your, your thoughts on that move by Joe Shane. So I, you know, I think, <laughs> Well, nothing surprises me about what Joe Shane does anymore. I think I, I'm, I've learned to, to expect the unexpected and to be pleasantly surprised with, what, I, with what, what we get when we hear what he's actually done. I think that, that uh, you're seeing the advantage of Joe Shane's connections around the league, even though he's still a young uh, GM. Uh, he's got a good relationship with his former team, and uh, I assume that that what this was was uh, was that the uh, Buffalo Bills were about to uh, release uh, or about to waive uh, Basham anyway, and they instead they managed to move up from a seventh to a sixth round pick in order to give him uh, to the Giants. And, and maybe not that much different from the Isaiah Simmons situation where, where the Cardinals were going to probably waive him. And so instead they got a draft pick for him and Shane took advantage of both of those things. We don't know what Basham's going to do as a giant. He was a second round draft pick and uh, thought to be a good prospect for the pros. And he did some good things as a Buffalo Bill but not enough good things and not not often enough and so it's a very low risk move that could potentially pay some dividends for the giants and you know the thing that i keep on i think coming back to every time the giants make some kind of a trade or some kind of a, a signing a free agent signing or whatever and it all comes back for me to the coaching staff and anytime they pick up someone i always think with this coaching staff, I bet this guy can make some plays, can do some good things. And, and that's the level of confidence that this coaching staff, I think, gives everyone about, about the prospects for the players. They feel that the players they get, they can maximize whatever their talents are. And it's not that Basham's going to become a Pro Bowl player under Wink Martindale. But if I had to bet money, I'd bet he's going to be a useful player under Wink Martindale. Absolutely. I think, Tony, I go back to the uh, the the media session that that assistant GM Brandon Brown held a couple of weeks ago. And and, and Brandon went into real detail about the process that the Giants go through, not only with draft picks, but with the detailed process that they go through with with the pro personnel department, with 
with looking into players across the league and preparing for roster cuts and, and all the fluid movement that happens throughout the year, just the amount of detail that they put into reports on these players and discussing players with the coaching staff and understanding not only you know what a player has done, but where he might fit into the Giants roster and whether they they think he's you know certain players are better than what they already have on the roster to the point of understanding they're not just taking a flyer on a player because oh we liked him coming out of college. They don't acquire anyone without an understanding of how they're going to use that player whether it was Isaiah Simmons, whether it's Boogie Basham, whether it's someone that they picked up from another organization and added to their practice squad. They have an idea, a plan. They've put detailed study and detailed thought into where this player fits. It's not just a, oh, we'll bring this guy in and see what happens. And I think that is one of the one of the things that gives you optimism long term about the direction of this franchise is just the fact that they're on the same page and the amount of the amount of detailed work they put into every player who ends up wearing a giant's uniform well i think that that uh presser that brandon brown did last week just sent giants fans all over into the stratosphere <laughs> uh because they you know they hear him talking about this and and first of all you say to yourself you know wow i can't believe that joe shane stole this guy from howie roseman <laughs> first of all, I mean, <laughs> yeah and, there is uh, that there is that and unfortunately and then, he's probably not going to keep him for a whole lot longer unfortunately either. they're not going to keep him very much longer because if if brandon brown doesn't become a gm in the next one or two years then then you really know that something is is seriously wrong uh with the nfl because it, it's it's hard to believe that this guy is is not already qualified uh, to be a GM compared to some of the, the people who are already GMs. But then the other thing that you say to yourself as a Giants fan is that, you know, wow, what a process they have in place. And you feel confident that when they're making a deal with another team for a player, you know, they're, they're really not, they're not flying blind. They know a lot about what this player has done and can do. And they've, they've watched the film and they know what the player's strengths and weaknesses are. And, and again, coming back to the coaching staff, then you know that the coaching staff, it's not just, this is my system, this is what you have to do in it, but how do you fit into the, the overall philosophy of what we mm -hmm. want to do and, and what do you do best and how can we exploit what you do best? And I think that's a consistent theme you see now from this coaching staff. And I think we saw that. Isaiah Simmons very surprisingly played a few snaps against the Jets in the preseason finale. I think he only played six snaps. But what we saw was Isaiah Simmons lined up on the line of scrimmage, whether it was in the A-gap, whether it was lined up as an off-ball linebacker, whether it was out on the edge somewhere. But what we saw was Isaiah Simmons tasked with doing one thing, go forward and wreak havoc. Yeah. And and, <laughs> and that I think that is that is precisely what the Giants are going to want him to do most of the time is go forward and 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 just wreak havoc in the backfield. Yeah, and you know the other thing I can say about about the two signings that they made is that both of them are at positions where you know when you start looking at the structure of the 53 man roster and even and then even the practice squad uh, you ask yourself where the weak points are. And so the Giants, to me, look look good at edge as long as you're talking about the starters, uh, Kayvon and, and Aziz. But then beyond that, the depth was very poor. Uh, O'Shane Zimenez, who who now winds up back on the practice squad, so he's not he's not gone, he's just on the practice squad. Uh, Taman Fox, I guess the same thing. Uh, you know, neither of them are really what you want as your primary backups at, at edge. Ellerson Smith, because of all the injuries, it just never worked out. I thought he had a lot of potential. And so you really were in a position at, at, at pass rush where, uh, wow, you get past those first two players. And if either of them is injured and both 
Thibodeau and Ojolari were injured for periods last year, you feel like you've got very little behind them. So, so you have now you have uh, Basham who can who can provide some backup uh, in case of an injury injury and can can rotate in to give the other guys some rest. You have Simmons again at the other position on defense of great weakness linebacker where they filled one hole with Bobby Okereke. And, you know, we'll hope that Micah McFadden's improved play in training camp kind of translates into the regular season that he can be a useful player now. But if he can't now, you, you know, you've got you've got Simmons there at least at least on passing downs. And, you know, and I'm imagining mm-hmm. that we're going to m- most of what we're going to see from Isaiah Simmons. I could be wrong. will be on passing downs and that maybe McFadden mm-hmm. will be in there more often early in the, in, in, in downs. And, uh, and you'll see Simmons come on and on third down or something like that to, uh, to do most of his stuff. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll see, but at least there, they, they, they tried to address two places where the giants depth was really an issue. And before we move off that, Tony, I just want to say a little bit more. One of the things that we saw here was the Giants did not were not awarded any players on waivers on Wednesday afternoon. And I think what we saw here, it's very clear that Joe Shane understood that the Giants were 26th in the waiver priority in the waiver claim order, which is based on it's the same right now as the as the NFL draft order. So Joe looked at two players he thought were going to come free that he thought could help them and aggressively moved to get them because he knew there was no way he would have a chance to get them on the uh, on the waiver wire. The other cool thing, Boogie Basham talked to media today, and Boogie Basham said that Joe Shane was the reason he got drafted in Buffalo hmm. and basically said, he figured that sooner or later he'd be here in New York playing for Shane anyway. Yeah, and 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 naturally, you know, you, you think about that particular situation, and uh, you realize that you know not only do you have the the, the Giants pro personnel department uh, evaluations of Basham, but you know that that you have Joe Shane in Buffalo uh, two years ago uh, doing the same work with the Buffalo scouts. And so you, you know, that, that he knew a lot about what Basham's strengths and weaknesses were as a, before he ever came to, to Buffalo. And so again, you have confidence that they, as you say, you know, they have some idea of what, what exactly it is they're going to do with this player. Absolutely. Tony, one of the things that has been a concern for the Giants is still a concern, is always a concern with the New York football Giants is the offensive line. Ever since that, the the deal, Snee, Soybert, um, you know, ever since that offensive line, you know, got old and had to retire, the Giants have never seemed to have been able to, to get it right. And This year, you have John Michael Schmitz, second-round pick, playing center. You have two early picks in Andrew Thomas and Evan Neal. But you still have questions, and one of the head-scratchers, one of the head-scratchers this time around was the Giants' decision to cut Tyree Phillips. Tyree Phillips is obviously now back on the practice squad, but that was a bit of a head-scratcher because Tyree Phillips – played well at right tackle last year, offers guard versatility. Um, And I know you and I offline talked a little bit about the, uh, about the, the potential issues with the offensive line. So just, uh, you know, your thoughts on, on Phillips, your thoughts on, uh, on the offensive line in general. So as I, as I mentioned to you offline, uh, you know, as a fan, it's very hard for me not to be excited about the coming season. I feel that, well, first of all, after last year, how could you not be excited to see to see the, the extreme capability of the coaching staff in the front office? And and uh, the front office has only, I think, exceeded expectations this off season. Uh, I don't think there's any other way to to describe what they what they've managed to do to to build the roster, uh, but. You know, it looks like they've got a, a, a difficult schedule coming up, and and uh, 
we'll, we'll hope that they can navigate it and that this won't be another 2016 to 2017 type of, of thing for the Giants. But, you know, I'm excited about the coming season because I feel like this team has, within two years, done a pretty decent job of addressing almost all of their their real weaknesses and the one thing that still is kind of sitting there in let's say to be charitable tbd uh state is is the offensive line okay obviously they're set at left tackle um john michael schmitz looked like he had a good preseason and we'll hope that that he'll more or less hit the ground running at center and have at least a solid rookie season. You know, I don't think you want to expect a rookie to be a, a pro bowl player uh, on the offensive line, but you, you hope that he'll be at least a, a solid player, especially solid in the run, which was his favorite thing in college, but at least adequate as a pass blocker. And then, you know, we know that Evan Neal is, is not Eric flowers. You know, that Eric Neal, Aaron, Evan Neal is a, is a serious, football player who wants to be great and we know that he's he's lost weight got himself into better shape worked with someone over the winter to try to refine his his technique and get into better positions and so on and so forth and we know that you know he wants to be good and he's a and he's a good giant and so i have every reason to think that he'll improve this year you know, to, to Pro Bowl level, you know, maybe not. I mean, I'll, I'll take it if he can, but but at least to be adequate, at least not to be a turnstile at at right tackle for for pass rushers. And so I'm I'm cautiously optimistic he'll be able to do that. And so maybe that means we kind of have three places on the offensive line that we're OK with the guard. We're, I think we're still in, in a position of hoping for adequate play and not being quite sure of whether we're going to get it. I think we, we know by now who Mark Lewinsky is, and he'll be okay, but he won't be great, be a better run, run blocker than a pass blocker. And we hope that somehow between between Bredesen and Azudu that we'll get decent play at uh, at left guard. But the thing that, that scares me to death is what happens if one of the tackles gets injured. And uh, before today, when they got Tyree Phillips back, all I was thinking of is that Matt Paird is the only other tackle on the roster right now. And you watched his performance against the Jets and you say, oh, my gosh, how could we go into the season with this person as our backup left tackle? And so now at least I feel that they have another reasonable option. But still, uh, I still have qualms about the offensive line. And and in my mind, I say, other than injuries, if there's one thing that's going to hold this team back from having a memorable 2023 season, the offensive line will be it. I need to say something about Matt Parrott because I think that on Wednesday, we didn't see the Giants make any waiver claims, as I said before. We didn't see them make any moves to add an offensive lineman. And I think if they could have, they would have. But I've said this before. Good offensive tackles aren't easy to find. The ones that are good are starting for their teams around the league. And there's a lot of offensive tackles who aren't very good that are starting for their teams as it is. And so if you if you trickle down and you go to the backups, there aren't a lot of good backup offensive tackles around the league because if they were good, they'd be playing. Yeah. So, you know, Matt Parrott had a lousy preseason, but Matt Parrott has also over the course of a couple of years, he's played well at times. He's played poorly at other times. He's your classic, typical backup. You're never quite sure what you're going to get, but, if there was a better offensive tackle that the Giants could have gotten their hands on, they would have. And and I think that if there is one that shakes loose, if they can find one at some point, they will. You know, but you know, you you do kind of cross your fingers and hope that that if Matt Parrott has to play, it's only for a game here or there, and that it's not for any sort of extended period of time. Look, the reality of it is that. You know, Joe Thomas, if Andrew Thomas gets hurt, Joe Thomas isn't coming out of retirement to play left tackle for the Giants. 
no matter who you put over there, there's going to be a significant drop off from Andrew Thomas. You just hope that you get reasonable play that doesn't destroy your ability to function on offense. And yeah, I'm not trying to defend Matt Parrott at all because I, I know how awful he was in the preseason, especially against the Jets. I mean, I tweeted it a few times, you know, just how badly he was playing. The reality of it is, though, just guys that are better than Parrott, you know, they're not they're not out on the street right now. They're just not. Yeah. And uh, the one thing I, I hold on to with Matt Parrott uh, is that first of all, I thought it was a good idea for her Dave Gettleman to draft him and he had taken Andrew Thomas in the first round. And so I thought the idea of taking another offensive tackle late in the, in the third round, I thought that was perfectly fine draft strategy by, by uh, Gettleman. And, and I think, you know, Pear was considered a relatively raw guy who needed some development, but he was considered a promising prospect at the time. And so I was, I was pretty happy with that draft pick. And, and, and the, the amazing thing is that Paired actually looked pretty good sometimes during his, his rookie year. I mean, they would, they would put him in for a couple of series to replace Andrew Thomas, and, and he'd look okay. He, I mean, he, mm-hmm. was, he was handling Chase Young when Chase Young was, was having his, his great uh, rookie season. And, uh, and I said, well, this guy really looks promising, and I figured that by year two we were going to see him as the starting right tackle. Uh, and then it, it just never happened after that. And the previous mm-hmm. coaching regime seemed to have it in for him. And they, I don't know whether they didn't think he was tough enough or, or what. Uh, and so I guess I still have hopes that, that, that he can be salvaged. He can, he can be uh, okay as, as a backup. Uh, but as you say, there aren't a lot of great offensive tackles around. And, and uh, there were only three of them, if I remember correctly, claimed off waivers today. So it's not as if there were a ton of them out there that other teams thought were useful. If there were a lot that were out there, probably half the teams in the league would like to add an offensive tackle if they could. Absolutely. Tony, let's talk a little bit about a player on the roster who, until a, until a couple days ago, I mean, I wasn't sure he was actually going to be available when the season started. And and that's Wandale Robinson, a guy that spent the entire summer on the pup list, guy who is still, at this point, less than nine months from his ACL surgery. And he's ahead of schedule said the other day that that he gave up a lot he sacrificed a lot to to get ready to be ready to be on this roster week one he's happy that he made it i'm happy for the kid that he made it Uh, i don't know if he's going to be able to contribute much week one or week two but i'm i'm happy for the kid that he's able to be part of the roster that the Giants think he'll contribute before five weeks into the season, which is the only reason they've got him on the roster. And, you know, this kid, you forget, you know, how well he played in that final game when he got hurt against Detroit. This kid can be a difference maker if he's if he's fully healthy and ready to go. Right. And so, you know, Wondell Robinson, right, is somebody that, has hardly been in any of the conversations leading into this season. And, you know, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind, really, I guess, for these people. But one of the, one of the fascinating things about this year's Giants, and, and, and it, didn't, it didn't really work out this way in the end due to the injuries, but, but, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you were looking at the Giants' wide receiver depth and saying – wow, this team is going to have to cut guys and probably more than one guy who is an NFL caliber receiver, which is not something that we were saying last year. Last year, the Giants were looking for anybody to to fill the position and you were, you know, and you were, you were keeping players on the, on the 53 or bringing them up to the 53 who, you know, really weren't NFL 
caliber receivers but but this year the giants have have such depth that receiver and forget about darren waller at tight end which and you can't forget about darren waller but but for the moment forget about Tar darren waller and you just look at the wide receiver room and basically what they have is a i don't want to say a flat wide receiver room but they've got a wide receiver room where there's not that much of a drop off from wide receiver one to wide receiver six and and yeah wandale robinson is this guy that Oh yeah, well, he was starting to do stuff. He scored his first touchdown against against Baltimore, and then, as you say, had like nine catches for a hundred yards uh, against Detroit. And he was he was starting to look like the real thing. People were dismissing him because he is quote unquote a small guy, and small guys get injured and they can't last for long in the NFL. But actually, Wandale Robinson is 185 pounds, and you know he's he's not that small. You know people people thought Devontae he's short. Smith, he's, short. <laughs> he's short. He's short. <laughs> right. He's short, but he's not small. And if and if you look at it, if you if you you know if you if you you watch the interviews at his locker that were taking place the last couple of days, you know he's a he's a muscular guy. He's not this. He's He's not this kind of slim guy like uh, uh, Devontae Smith, you know, was was thought to be. And people thought Devontae Smith wasn't going to be able to hold up in the NFL at, at 170 pounds. And Devontae Smith has, I think, done OK for himself in the NFL. You know, Wondell Robinson is, is is more of a kind of a short, stocky player, but he's but he's speedy and he's and he's really quick. And I think that he's he's someone that no one's paying attention to who could really be an interesting part of the offense this year. Absolutely. And I, I will just throw in also there's six wide receivers on the roster and there's a pretty darn successful veteran wide receiver who's sitting there on the practice squad getting healthy in Cole Beasley. And I would argue also that the Giants did cut two NFL caliber wide receivers who belong on rosters in Colin Johnson and Jamison Crowder. So right, right. And you know, you look at the fans' reactions, right, to 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 the injuries, and they're going, Oh, Colin Johnson, I really wanted him to make the 53. And then you hear about Bryce Ford. We so I thought for sure he was gonna make the 53. It's too bad he and is uh, uh correct me, is Bryce Ford Wheaton the first ACL injury on the new MetLife turf? Is that oh you had to go there, didn't you? <laughs> I thought about that the other day. I didn't tweet it, I didn't bring it up, I hadn't mentioned it. But yes, Bryce yeah, well, Ford we we'll, we'll gets the fewer. he gets the the dishonor of being the first ACL injury on the new turf at MetLife Stadium. Yeah. But <laughs> so. anyway, but coming back to the original thing, I, I really like the Giants wide receiver core. And and I think Wandell Robinson is is going to be an unexpectedly interesting part of the Giants offense this season. Absolutely. And as you said, it's out of sight, out of mind. We haven't seen him practice. We haven't seen anything. You forget what he can do and you forget that all of the things that we've seen Paris Campbell do throughout the summer, catching passes lined up as a running back, taking a handoff once in a while. Those are all things that are actually in the Giants playbook, probably with Wandale Robinson in mind. Mm -hmm. You don't forget this. This is a kid that was a running back for two years in college is very much is very much used to, you know, coming out of the backfield, catching passes out of the backfield, handling the ball in the running game, doing all of those things. And he very much fits what Brian Dable and Mike Kafka like, which is the the guys who you can scheme to get open and guys who can get yards after catch once you get the ball in their hands yeah and and not that i'm an offensive strategist i'm i'm far from it but when i was watching the jets game the other night and watching how how Kafka called called two deep passes to Jalen Hyatt right off the bat going up against Sauce Gardner, which I thought was was tremendously amusing. And I knew, and I was wondering who I saw. I wondered why he did that. And one of the the things that crossed my mind about my mind about why he did that was to just get it in the heads of the teams the Giants were were going to play that 
that he was going to send this guy deep and you better account for him and you better make well, sure that he's covered. And 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 even the no. Jets, even though even though he had sauce on him, the Jets brought a safety over over to help out on that on that second play. And and my thinking about that is that they're going to do that during the season with not necessarily any intention of passing the ball to Jalen Hyatt, but instead of clearing out that middle of the field and everybody's going to go over and pay attention well, to Jalen Hyatt. And then they're going to go over and hit Waller or Campbell or someone like Wandale Robinson over the middle who'll be like open by 10 yards because everybody's paying attention to Hyatt. Well, there's a, when I think about it and I hadn't really, I hadn't really thought about it in those terms, but, but when you put it that way, there's a very clear message in there because we know that sauce Gardner might be the best cornerback in the league. There's a very clear message in there that says, we feel like we have weapons to attack any defensive back in this league. And that's the kind of thing that, that, you know, defensive coordinators, when they watch that film will notice, you know, they're, they, they'll come after everybody. And, uh, you know, and, and that's, that's a far cry from what we've seen from the giants offense over the last few years. Yeah, and I just think the whole Giants offensive philosophy with Mike Kafka is is to get you thinking about something and then do something else. Absolutely. Tony, let's talk a little bit about uh, you know a couple of other uh, interesting things that happened on the roster. Darnay Holmes made this roster, which you know a couple of months ago I wasn't sure was going to happen. I said over and over that I thought he was a – a candidate to be cut because of his because of his cap hit and what ultimately happened here was Aaron Robinson never got on the field you know Aaron Robinson promising third year corner never got on the field the giants looked at a situation where Adoree Jackson's going to be playing in the slot they looked at the rust there's there wasn't another backup slot corner available you know Darnay Holmes I have my qualms with him as a player, with his production over the last couple of years, but he's an experienced, adequate slot corner. Took the pay cut. I have my issues with the pay cut, too, to be honest with you, because as, as somebody pointed out to me the other day, this is two years in a row with Darius Slayton being forced to take a pay cut. And now the reason why these guys were in that situation the NFL has what they call proven performance escalators. Guys that are second to seventh round picks when they get to their fourth NFL season, they can get a pay bump based on playing time, based on by whatever formula the NFL uses. If they have played more, produced more than, than the average player at their draft slot, they get a pay bump. The problem with those pay bumps is, as Darius Slayton and, and Darnay Holmes have learned, is those pay bumps are not guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Because two years in a row, we've seen the NFL give Giants players those escalators, and then we've seen the Giants turn around and say, well, that's nice and all well and good, but you're going to play for the league minimum if you're going to play for us at all. And, and, and I find that unfortunate for players, but... Uh, you know, but but maybe that's that's an issue for the next CBA, I guess. Yeah, I was going to say that that I think I think we we know in in football as in as in uh, national affairs or state affairs or local affairs, uh, you pass laws, quote unquote, you know that that have an intention to accomplish something, and there are often unintended consequences of those laws or rules or, or whatever that you ha then have to go back and, and fix. And so I think the, the proven performance escalator was a good idea in principle. But as you say, two years in a row for the Giants, it has uh, wound up being, being a problem for the, the player involved. And I don't know how you fix that going, going forward. Uh, I think the idea that a player that was drafted uh, after day one who performs very well, that there should be a mechanism for, for the team to reward that player's play. And, and uh, 
obviously it's going to happen to to a lot of people right but uh i don't know whether the answer is that you make those proven for in the next cba you make those proven performance escalators something that can exist outside of the salary cap so that if you have a player in that situation uh and and gets that proven performance escalator then uh that doesn't count against the cap and you can go over the cap for that purpose and that purpose only i mean there, there are probably ways that you can get around it so the teams don't feel incentivized to to take that away from the player in order to 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 get their own cap balance into into uh good shape yeah absolutely it's just i i just find it unfortunate that that they've earned it and they don't get yeah. it and hopefully uh, down the road in the next cba they'll look into into taking care of that issue tony i want to talk about uh before we before we wrap it up i want to talk about the practice squad for just a minute on wednesday the giants officially signed 12 players to their 16 player practice squad officially those 12 were all players that were with them in training camp in the preseason we we saw reports of of two other signings one a wide receiver from who i guess spent the preseason with dallas and the other one is the guy that I am officially nominating for the most interesting player on the Giants practice squad, and that is Tyree Jackson, tight end, formerly spent the last two years with the Eagles, former college quarterback converting to tight end. And and I I have to be honest, I, I have visions of Tyree Jackson turning into Logan Thomas. <laughs> right. <laughs> so interesting. Interesting little fact about Tyree Jackson that I only learned today on Twitter. Sometimes Twitter is good for something or what used to be known as Twitter. The platform uh, formerly known as Twitter. Form, as Twitter, yes. right? Uh, so in in Madden 2019. Oh, I love this. Rook, rookie quarterback rankings. Okay, Daniel Jones was QB6 in the Madden rankings, and Tyree Jackson was QB5, a point ahead of Daniel Jones. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. I saw that today, too. I'm glad you mentioned it. It's, uh, it's one of those hilarious, hilarious things. I mean, but, but are we saying, Tony, are we saying that Daniel Jones should bulk up and play tight end? I think so. Well, well, he's been doing that, right? He said he put on 10 pounds, right, during the offseason, <laughs> right? And so, and so I maybe- will. I will say I, I've been around him enough in training camp and sat in enough of his of his pressers. He is obviously bigger and stronger. Obviously, it's yeah. noticeable that he's bigger and stronger. But but yeah, are we saying that Daniel Jones has a future as a tight end? Yeah, I, I, I think that that must be it. They're gonna you know they're gonna start running running wildcat, and he's gonna line up at tight end, and and, and you know and and ship and ship an, an edge defender, and then go and then go out for a pass. I mean, I think we're gonna. And, I mean, with with Mike and, Kafka, anything is possible. And they can activate Tommy DeVito and let Tommy DeVito play quarterback. And that'll make Absolutely. everybody happy. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but but in all seriousness, about uh, about Daniel Jones. I'm gonna have to say, I mean, as long as it doesn't affect his his passing in any in any negative way, I like to see him bulking up because, I mean, frankly, a lot of Daniel Jones' game is his running game, and mm-hmm. Daniel Jones does take hits out there, yes, uh, he does. because he runs the ball. And so, you know, if 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 the work he did in the off season makes him a little bit more resistant to the hits that he's going to take, then you know, I'm perfectly fine with that. Absolutely. Tony, is there anything else about this roster? Any other players you want to highlight before we uh, before we wrap it up? The only thing I'll say is that I'm 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 glad to see them having brought a few other players back on the practice squad. So I felt felt really bad about Darian Beavers, who looked like he was going to win a starting linebacker job last season before he he had his ACL and and I gather from from everything I read about about what was happening during this training camp, it, it looks like he he hasn't fully recovered from it yet. That he's a step slow, and so on and so forth. And so, you know, you'd hate to see his his career uh, uh, derailed by that. And so to have him on the practice squad, I feel like at least it gives him uh, another chance. Another guy on the practice squad that that I'm glad to see there is Alex Cook because I thought he had a a pretty nice preseason 
for the Giants, and he's someone I could imagine being on the 53. Uh, I actually, I I had him on the 53, and you know, I realized that what I did was I gave Alex Cook the spot that that really went to seventh round pick Javarius Owens. Mm -hmm. And, and what I did in that instance was I overreacted to the hamstring injury that Owens suffered on Saturday against the jets, which, you know, we're, we weren't going to get any information on the severity of that. And, and I overreacted to, to that injury, not thinking about the fact that there's a couple of weeks before the, you know, before the, the Dallas game. And then you, you don't even have to put the player on the active roster for the first week or two. Cause you, you know, if he, if he's hurt, but, but I would have penciled cook in for the practice squad, but you're right. He, he had a good preseason and this is a good outcome for him to land on the practice squad. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually I feel like the giants, I mean, the giants still have question marks overall at safety, but this is another situation where actually they have, have a, a fairly large number of players who are kind of interesting at safety and if one or two of them first of all if Xavier McKinney can actually go back to the way he played in 2021 I mean that solves one problem and then and then they have like four or five other guys who all potentially could be players at the other safety position and the Giants you know run a lot of dime packages and so there's plenty of opportunities for guys to get out there at safety and so they have kind of some interesting players who you just can't be certain about yet at that position and Cook is right. one of them right because they really haven't proven it full time yet but yeah. we will we will begin to see shortly Tony another another uh, another few days and we will be uh, preparing for and writing about and talking about an actual regular season Giants football game. So we're almost there. I can't believe it. Actually, um, the time went more quickly than I could imagine. That's because th that that's because we just have so much fun talking to each other all the time. Oh, I think so. I think that's, it. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it is. Old guys talking ball. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Tony, thank you. Thank you, as always. Giants fans, thank you, as always, for listening and putting up with our nonsense. Please uh, stay safe out there. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.